Welcome everyone to Coaching in the Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about health and wellness, nutrition, accountability. I mean, you name it. If it deals with the body, mind, and soul, we are probably going to be talking about it because there's a difference between learning how to be as a human and being effective in that manner and then just kind of moving along life with our circumstances and then creating excuses for ourselves. We have to show up. We have to be that person that says, you know what? I can make a change in my life. And then how do I do that? Well, I have good news for you. Today, I'm going to be bringing on a guest coach, Ali Cass, who's going to be a coach that deals with fitness, functional health. And we really chime in on the functional health aspect more so than the fitness. The fitness is going to be an aspect to the episode, to the video, but we really look at functional health. How can we put ourselves, our body, in the best shape possible? Because if our body is in the best shape possible, we have more energy. If our mind is in the best shape possible, we are more positive. And I mean, it's more than just more energy and positivity. That's just a start. But you have to start. Many people, they give themselves a dream, a fantasy per se, but they don't take action. They say, oh, it would be so nice to be this dress size or this weight or to fit into these old clothes. But yet we just keep doing the same old things that are just putting us deeper, deeper and deeper into that hole that we have dug for ourselves. And it's easy for us to lose track of where we were and where we're going. Because as life goes on, we might not necessarily know what's happening because we are just so busy. It's always something new. There's always a new task. There's always something that has our attention. Well, maybe we should have our attention. Maybe we should look at our life. And I think this interview with Ali Cass and myself, we really take a good look at our life, at your life, and then what changes need to be made for you to live the best life possible. So let's get into the interview with Ali and myself. Welcome, Ali Cass, to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. So today I have you on as a functional health and fitness coach. I know that is going to be dealing with fitness, dealing with health, dealing with functional body and mind. There's a lot to it. There's a lot to the body and lots to the mind. And I mean, we are just pushing out these episodes over and over again. And it's like, is there a stop? And there's not because the body is always changing. There's so much to the body. There's so many different circumstances. And the same thing is true with the mind. And the work that you do touches base on both of them. If you can, please introduce yourself to the world and tell everyone how you help. Hi, my name is Ali Cass. Um, like Michael mentioned, I'm a functional health and fitness coach. And what that really means is that I help people to not only overcome health challenges, but I really help them optimize their health so that way they can live their best life, essentially. I come from a very athletic background. I got my start in fitness and I was a physique competitor. And that was great at the time, but that kind of opened that door, like you mentioned, to what I call the biggest rabbit hole that I've ever gone down in my entire life. And that is mind body health. What does that really mean? What does that encompass? And like you mentioned, how that changes from circumstance to circumstance or person to person. And so for me, helping others achieve their best level of health and fitness is really about allowing them to show up in their life in the best way possible, because let's face it, we don't have forever here. <laughs> and so um, for me, it's important to make sure that quality of life is always the, the biggest factor. It is something that I help people achieve when we work together. And let's break down the aspect of mind, body, and health, whether you just talk about the mind first and the body, and then overall health, it could be about your own circumstances dealing with mind, body, health, or maybe if you wanted to even go down the line of the majority of my clients are this. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that in our Western medical model, we've done a really good job of breaking the parts of the body into separate entities. And to mention that, just to totally separate the mind and the body from one another. And I think that that was originally done as a way to kind of teach people, you know, how different parts of the body function. But the reality is, is that they all function together. So we have this model where we have these different specialists that we go see for your heart or your, your brain or a psychologist for more of that kind of mind component. But the reality is, is that 
everything is all working together um, constantly, whether it's the various systems of the body or your actual mind and emotional connection with your body. Um, one of the biggest ways that I see this play out for my clients, and I've seen this for myself, is that you can have the best fitness plan. You can have like the best health protocol, but if you are constantly in either, you know, a very stressful job or maybe a toxic relationship, or in my case, something that was present for me because I went through some very traumatic losses early on in my life was carrying that grief and carrying that burden from um, going through those experiences. And when you carry that kind of energy with you, it doesn't matter what you're eating. It doesn't matter how you're working out. You're still not going to be the healthiest person that you can be. And you're still not going to show up in the most powerful way in your own life. Yeah. And trauma is one of those things and grief. I mean, we are just not good at dealing with grief as humans, especially in our world today before it was almost something that happened more frequently. Now we have a longer lifespan. So people are living to 65, 70, 80. That's a long life before people were dying at 32. So we learn to appreciate things a lot quicker. I think when we look at the concept of time, we say, well, we have time, right? You have 30 more years versus, well, you know, I'm 20. I had 10 more years to live. When we're 20 at this time in our life, in our society, it's like, I'm just starting life. I'm just starting my career. I'm just starting to finally make my brand on the world. What that does is it creates a lot of stress, I think, in many people's lives is because they have all of this peer pressure, parental pressure, societal pressure, that they have to be someone. And it causes them to look at the body image, to look at the perfect mind image, uh, you know, perfect girlfriend, the perfect uh, spouse, you know, like, like whatever that label is. So we give ourselves so many different stresses. Why do you think many people have a difficult time relinquishing what the majority of people will have views for them. For example, you have to be this standard of person. You have to act this way. Very critical in the sense of who you are. But then again, you said something interesting in the beginning. We all have like a unique body, mind, and soul situation. So why do we have a different situation, but we give ourselves the same stresses? That is a great question. I think that for at least for myself and a lot of the women that I work with, a lot of it is societal and it's something that whether it's physically pushed upon us growing up or it's just something that we subliminally pick up in advertising and, and marketing. Um, I do think though that as human beings, there's the evolutionary component of our physiology that competes to survive. And so I think that there's that part of us that's kind of hardwired to be competitive in those senses. But now we have all of this other stimulus from our society that's telling us that we have to look a certain way, we have to be a certain way. I also believe that we live in a society that very much values status and title. And that was something for me that was extremely difficult when I was in my early 20s, because I didn't really want to be a doctor. And I really didn't want to be a lawyer. And I didn't really want to do these things that had these, you know, titles that if you told someone that that's what you were, you know, you kind of get this like standing ovation just for saying, hey, I'm Allie, I'm, you know, XYZ. But I knew that I really wanted to make an impact. And I knew that I wanted my path to be purposeful. And so I think that there's a lot of that kind of focus on facade in our society, whether it is through body image or how much money you make or, or what your title is. And I think that as we continue and as we become more modernize and kind of go down that route um, that those things are continuously being pushed. And so one of the things that I love seeing now, particularly on social media, is people commending other people for taking rest or for, you know, getting out. Like you, you could have a great job and that's fine. But if you hate it, if it's ruining your life, if it's ruining your health, then get out of it. That's okay. Like that is commendable too. So I think there's this push now that's just recently started toward encouraging people to get out of situations or to start living in a way that is more aligned and authentic for them. And I think that's beautiful. And I think that's one of the key steps to start kind of breaking that cycle. This is a two-pronged question I'm going to ask you. So I'm going to ask for a quick one, and then it's going to be a longer one. Who do you think has more stress, men or women? I don't know that I would say either. I think I'm a little biased because I'm a woman. So I'll speak from the woman's point of view, unless that's the next question. <laughs> no, no, no. I want just your answer, just a conversation. So I think both, but I think for women, there's now this pressure of, you know, show up, go be a career woman, you know, don't, it's not just up to the man to provide for the family. For women, I feel like there's this dichotomy of wanting to have a career, wanting to provide, also not wanting to feel like we're taking advantage of a man for providing for the family. However, then I feel like there's also this 
pressure to continue to show up to have children, carry children, take care of them. So I feel like there's a lot that's placed on women. And I think as women, we also take a lot of that on ourselves because we tend to want to be that nurturer. We tend to want to help. So I think a lot of that is also self-induced as well. But I also think there's pressure on men to show up and provide and to do these other things. And so I think that men are faced with their own challenges that I'm personally haven't been privy to in my, my existence. But I do think that situationally and circumstantially, we just we all have stressors and we all have that burden. It's just, you know, slightly different in the way that it might show up for us. For me, just looking at like the societal aspect of it, right? If we look at who society views at more, right? So do they look at men more or do they look at women more? Typically society looks at women more. That's why there's so many commercials on beauty products and different types of clothes and outfits and things like that versus men take them fishing, you know, and give them a flannel. He's probably going to be okay. The stresses that are happening right now are almost self-inflicted because we are a, a society that are saying you need to have these standards. And I think those standards are causing the stress. Men have standards too, yes, to that stress aspect, but the standards are a little bit different when it comes to society, how they view women versus society, how they view men. Men have a pretty simple job, protect and provide, right? Women, on the other hand, they have to look a certain way. They have to be feminine. They have to be submissive. They have to be good mothers. Down that rabbit hole of what society says. And I think because I was reading your profile, you help people with stress. You help people with overcoming stress. And it's part of actually fitness and health to not be stressed because that stress can cause, can deprive you from sleep. It can cause eating disorders. You name it under the sun, you can have a problem just because you're stressed. How can we start to alleviate some of that stress, shed some of those veils that we give ourselves rather than just tacking on, tacking on, tacking on and saying, oh, this is just normal? That's a great question. One of the things that I like to do with clients, and I think this applies to many circumstances, but in that initial stage, I try to just help them bring a new level of self-awareness that they may not have had before. So where are those areas that you're constantly feeling like you need to show up in a certain way, or you need to look a certain way, or where are you really comparing yourself to other women? I have clients who are like collegiate athletes. And so for them, it's performance, performance, performance. Whereas I have other women who it is very much more aesthetic. I have to look a certain way. Some celebrity is changing the way that they look now. So now I need to match that. And so I try to help them bring that awareness to which areas they're really, you know, self-imposing those types of beliefs. And then we do, we sit down and we look at their values. So this is something I've been doing recently with clients is helping them choose like the top five values that they have. So is that freedom? Is that discipline? What does that look like? And that's with your entire life. And I'm sure you do very similar things with people being a life coach and helping them tie those back into what we're doing in health and fitness, whether that's shifting the way that they're looking at exercise or reframing the way that they approach how they look and speak and think about their body. And so making sure that I know what their values are as far as what they want to accomplish in their life. And then looking at what are those things that are not aligning with that? And what is it that we can do? And that we're doing that ties into that to always go back to that value based motivation, I guess. And so a lot of times what I see is that what these women have as an expectation is not even aligned with their value <laughs> of what they want to do in life or how they want to live or how they want to show up. And so once we're able to kind of take that step back, and I think when you're able to reassess yourself and look at yourself objectively and not be so emotionally attached to whatever it is that you're experiencing, you're kind of like, oh, okay, like maybe I don't really want that, or maybe it is okay to not be that or whatever the case is. And so I try to help bring that, that new level of awareness um, where they can kind of disconnect from that emotion of like, oh my God, like I didn't lose five pounds and I've been working with you for three weeks. And you know, all of this thing. So yeah, that, that's kind of how I like to approach it, at least at the beginning. So we can kind of start digging into that area more as we work together. And you said something interesting. You said how they view their body. Mm. There's a difference though, how they view their body to how society views your body. So for example, let's say I have to use you as an example because we're talking about women. Okay. Yeah. So you're 300 pounds overweight. Okay. So you're 300 pounds obese. You can be considered big and beautiful, right? You mm -hmm. can look in the mirror and say, I'm beautiful, right? Maybe you can have, you know, very uh, stressful day, anxiety, all that stuff. So you might look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I look disgusting, right? It could be about, about different situations too. So depending on your mood, 
uh, emotions that are going in your on your body. Maybe someone said something to you on the street saying, oh, you are big or you're fat or whatever or ugly. That kind of sticks with you, right? But then you might get a group of women or a group of people saying, no, you're beautiful just the way you are. You don't have to change, right? Do you think that it's a healthy way to be? If if someone says that you're beautiful just the way you are, but not even looking at BMI, but looking at your own skin too, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you can lie to yourself, but you can't lie to the subconscious mind. A million percent. I don't necessarily consider either of those the best approach. I definitely think that as humans, we are beautiful regardless of our bodies because we are are here, right? Like we incarnated into this physical being, we have a soul. And I think that in itself is beautiful. And what we're able to do in life and create in life is absolutely wonderful. I think that people are beautiful no matter what size they're at. But I this is where I kind of have a, a little bit of friction with the body positivity, self-love movement, because I am a firm believer that you can love yourself and feel positively about your body and still want to change it, still have those health goals, still realize like, Hey, I don't feel my best. Or, Hey, I know that whatever I've been doing up until this point might not be the healthiest thing for me. So I think that you can acknowledge that you are beautiful at regardless of your size, because again, health is not a look, it's not a certain shape or size. And still say, I'm beautiful because I am me. I'm beautiful because I'm here showing up for myself. But what else is beautiful is also being realistic with yourself and saying, hey, like, you know, I have been my own worst enemy. We all have done this, you know, throughout life and whatever I'm feeling or experiencing right now, I still desire to change that. And I can still be beautiful and love myself where I'm at and know that I am taking the steps necessary to make myself the best version of myself. And that again, doesn't look a certain way. It doesn't have a certain shape or size. But I do think that one of the biggest acts of self-love is actually getting real with yourself and saying, hey, where have I been standing in my own way? And what can I do to change it? And I think that when I work with people, one of the first things we do when we sit down and figure out what it is they want to accomplish is I try to ask them their why. Why do you want to accomplish this? And what is your intention? Because if the intention is like, oh, well, I want to look like a Kardashian or I want to look a certain way because I feel like it's going to make me more worthy then that's not a really powerful intention. And that's most likely coming from that place of having some kind of hurt or limiting self-belief that we're carrying deep within us and that subconscious mind. But they say, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds because I want to have more energy to play with my kids or, you know, whatever it is. And I can tell that it's because they're doing it out of a place of love. Then I'm like, all right, girl, like let's rock and roll. We're going to get it. So intention for me is everything when we start the process. And in the beginning phase of working out, it's very difficult, especially for the mind, because you have to overcome that hurdle. You're on the Stairmaster and you're two minutes in, you feel like you're going to throw up, feel like you're going to fall off, you're going to embarrass yourself. So there's all of these different types of uh, conversations are happening in your head. Get off, stop. You know, you're going to be sick or, you know, whatever that conversation is, it's difficult to get over that hump in the beginning. And then once you get used to it, build that habit, it becomes a little bit easier. They start to see the changes and it doesn't happen overnight. Of course, you might be in the gym working maybe for three months before you start to see like really night and day results. And I always encourage people to take at least two photos every single month on the first and on the 15th. And then in three months, you can look at the first month of how you looked and then look at the difference. You start to see that progress. And then it's not that you look at yourself like, oh, I was disgusting. It's like, oh, look at the progress I made. It's just how you view things. And I think sometimes when people are starting off on that workout process or that workout regime or getting a fitness trainer or coach, they see the struggle only. They only see the struggle. They only see the pain. They don't see what comes next. And it's hard to show them what comes next until that three month or that six month point where we have the picture from day one to now six months. This is what you did. Like how empowering is that for someone to see the change, the results that they have gone through from day one to month six? It is so empowering. And that's honestly the reason why I got into this line of work, because once I saw that transformation for myself and realizing that When you have the right strategy for where you're at at that time and you have the right support system, it's really not rocket science anymore. It really is just about putting your head down and focusing on the next step and executing. And so I think that that transformation is so powerful. And one of the things I see in my work is that most of these women, when they come to me, they believe in themselves 
themselves, but there is that shadow of doubt in them where I'm like, you know, I ask them, do you trust me? And they say, well, yeah. And I'm like, okay, just trust me, trust the process. Um, I'm very big on if we need to course correct as we go, we are going to do that right away. So we have the strategy now just set your goal and then forget about it and just focus on what we have to do each time we're faced with making a new decision or each day that we wake up and we have to execute on our program. Those changes are so powerful. I have a client right now who is a mindset coach and she does a lot of work with women on self-identity. And she actually sent me a message on Monday of this week and she could start to see a little visibility and definition in her abs. Now, this isn't necessarily the goal that we're working toward, but she was really excited. And one of the things that surprised her the most was how excited she was about seeing those visible changes with all of the self-image and identity work that she has done. So I had to, you know, reinforce that your excitement isn't just because you know, you think that you should look a certain way, but you're seeing the results. You're showing up every day, you're putting in the work and now you feel it. I know that you feel stronger, you feel better, you have more energy, but now you're actually seeing a physical manifestation of the work that you're doing. And that's exciting because that continues to reinforce like, Hey, what I'm doing is working. And so we just continue to build that belief. And so I think that it is a very powerful component because I think that it just gives people a whole new level of self-belief and they don't think that they can accomplish something. And then they keep showing up for themselves and they say, wow, like now I know that I can do this for myself and gain that whole new level of self-trust as well, because you know that you're going to show up for yourself and get it done. And there's a big difference between someone who sits by and remains idle and someone who takes action. And it's the idea of understanding that you're the person that's responsible for you, where you can decide whatever you want for yourself, whether it's be better mind, better body, better life, better relationship. That's something that you have to decide. I think sometimes people just allow circumstance to take over and they don't take ownership of their life. They just say, well, you know, this happened, you know, my circumstances, I grew up poor, this is the way it has to be oh, you know, my parents are skinny, so I'm skinny, or my parents are big bone, so I'm big bone. It is that way of thinking of you're just looking at your surroundings, your environment, and you're just finding the most valid excuse that you can give yourself to feel good. But at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, do you honestly feel good? And I remember this is a little bit different in the sense of fitness, but it's dealing with happiness. I remember when my brother had came into my bedroom when I was like 21, I was in college and he asked me if I was happy. And I was like, of course I'm happy, right? I'm getting good grades. I have great friends. And I was just looking at the superficial happiness, what society wanted for me. And then he said, no, no, no. Like, are you happy? I really had to look at that word. I really had to look at if I was happy, every aspect of my life. And it wasn't just right now feeling okay. Because I think most people feel okay in their skin, right? Typically, people won't lose weight or they won't try to, you know, drop a dress size or fit in their old suit unless they have a trauma, right? Typically, a doctor says, hey, you borderline diabetic, you need to change this. Then it's kind of like call to action. I need to change. Otherwise, I'm going to be a diabetic or I'm going to be in, you know, the hospital or in and out of therapy or whatever, right? We wait until something bad happens in our life before we take ownership. And it's at that point, do we really have ownership anymore? Because now it's like, you don't have a choice. So we have a choice today. I will say most people have a choice that they can choose a healthy body, healthy mind, healthy life, or they can keep doing what they're doing. Maybe that is going to deteriorate them slowly, but surely. Then they finally get to that point where they can't keep that lifestyle anymore. They have to take action. Why do you think people wait to take action rather than taking action today? I think that as a society in general, we're extremely reactive with all things. I don't think that we are very good yet at taking a proactive approach to things, whether that's with our health or safety or security, anything like that. So I think that's just something that we also kind of growing up adopt as as part of how we approach things. But I think that for a lot of people that short-term pleasure of not changing is stronger for them than actually changing. So you know what I mean? Like that dopamine hit that I get from like grabbing that chocolate bar to me, I'm like, Ooh, I know that I shouldn't, but Ooh, for the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna feel really good. And I think that um, a lot of people allow that short-term pleasure to overpower the discipline that it takes in that moment to then achieve what's actually going to feel pleasurable long-term. And I want to say, it maybe is Tony Robbins who talks a lot about this, but 
Um, I, I see that a lot with people where once we can get them out of that, you know, short term, I want to feel good in the moment mindset, help them get into that longer term mindset is where I tend to see that they have more success. And like you mentioned, a lot of these people have pain or trauma. So I think that that short-term pleasure is also a way that we divert our mind and our emotions away from feeling that pain. And so it just kind of becomes that reactive, like soothing myself in the moment habit. And then, yeah, of course, as we're doing it over the course of longer period of time, it really just becomes something that we do and we don't even realize we're doing it oftentimes. Yeah, no, what you said was brilliant because it's in line with procrastination. I don't want to show up, so I'm going to be on my smartphone. I don't want to face my emotions and deal with who I am. So I'm going to go to the fridge and I'm going to eat some ice cream. And, and I'm going to keep eating ice cream every single time I feel a certain way, right? So then we kind of dig our own grave in the sense of how much work we have to do in order to get to the body that we truly want versus the body that we're giving ourselves because it's easy. You're right. People do choose easy. The brain loves easy. If the brain didn't have to do any work, the brain would not do any work. The brain's job is to use as little energy as possible and to keep itself alive. That is it. Working out. If you don't have to be a certain physique, especially now, you don't have to work out, right? Before we had to go out and procure our own foods. Now we can have the food delivered to our home. We don't even have to leave the house. We don't have to be mobile. We don't have to be active. It's causing a very still life where many people don't move. Many people don't take action. And I always tell people who are coming to me and they say, Michael, I want to get in shape and, and I want to get into a better body, better mind. I said, okay. I said, well, tell me about your workout regime or regiment that you have. And they said, well, I don't have one. I say, okay, well, do you have a mailbox? And they say, yeah, I have a mailbox. So I want you to walk to that mailbox. And then they'll walk to the mailbox and they're like, all right, I'm done. I say, I want you to do that three days or five days out of the week, right? Talk to me then. So then they will come back to me and I ask them five or six days later, hey, did you walk to the mailbox five or six times or, or whatever I told them to do? And I just want to see their mindset. No, I didn't have time. Oh, you didn't have time. So you didn't have time to walk down your driveway to your mailbox. And if you live in a cul-de-sac, then you didn't have time to walk maybe 200 feet to your mailbox. We give ourselves excuses. We say, we don't have time. We don't know the know-how. Again, it's that excuse. We live in a very excuse-driven society. And I have many clients that I call out every single day. You're full of excuses. I typically say the S word, but I'm not going to say it today because I said the S word like I think two episodes ago. You are full of excuses. And we give ourselves so many excuses. Why do you think people are so quick to use an excuse and not take ownership. Like you said, I think the brain likes the easy way out. Um, I think that a lot of people don't have accountability to themselves, especially, which is the biggest thing, but obviously not working with someone or having, you know, maybe a support system at home that challenges you or encourages you to be better. I think that when we surround ourselves with people who are just kind of making the effort to be better in any area of their life. Um, it's really easy to get into that place as well. But um, for me, self-accountability is a huge thing. So even when I work with people, I'm there for accountability, but I'm like, I'm teaching you self-accountability because as much as I want to work with you forever, that's doing you a disservice. I think that, like you mentioned, we are wired to choose the easy way out. But unfortunately, the society that we live in now, the easy way is like the really easy way. It's not like, oh, okay, you know, we don't have to maybe go out and pick food today or nothing is trying to attack us today. It's like, oh no, we can just sit on our couch and hit a button and like my food is delivered to me. Um, I don't even need to leave my house. I can get on you know, online and talk to a doctor on telehealth. You know, I don't even have to like get off of this couch. So I think that my mentor, he used to say that our bodies are like these old, like, you know, 1990 computers, like we're like the first gen computers, but we we're trying to run this super advanced software, which is, you know, our current modern society on this like super old computer. And if, you know, anyone's ever like not updated their, their MacBook or one of their devices for a really long time, and it's now older, you're like, oh, I get it. Like it's, this is not working right. And so that really resonated with me because I'm like, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, like we have not changed, our bodies have not changed with the same type of rapid pace that our society has changed. Um, and I think that's a lot of where our disease manifestation comes from, because we live in this totally different world, yet our bodies still need those things like exercise. We still need those healthy stressors, we need to be challenged. And we're typically not like survival is very rarely a true concern for us now. And where do you think accountability stems from? Like, where's the first learned? Because many people in our society lack accountability. 
And even if they have a partner or if they have a coach, they still will find a way to not be accountable. So like looking at accountability, how to be more accountable, where did we go wrong in society maybe, where this is the point where it's like people began to be less accountable for themselves and their actions. That's a great question. For me personally, accountability was something that was kind of ingrained in me from a young age because I was an athlete and I was very fortunate to have coaches who were very big on teaching mental discipline and toughness. Like we, we were great physically, but they really nailed in that, like that showing up, staying disciplined, staying focused when you're, you know, kind of in that quote unquote battlefield of whatever sport that you're playing. But I've noticed since not being in that competitive arena, I myself have a tendency to start going back to that, that place where I'm like, well, you know, I can, I can slack a little bit. So I think that I just don't think we're taught at a young age, unless you're, you know, in a circumstance like that, or you have parents who maybe ingrain that in you. And I think that for a lot of people and myself included as an adult, um, when I started kind of getting out of that place, it's not until you either have a big like wake up moment, which could be, you know, something tragic with your health or losing someone. For me, that was losing my mom at a very young age when she was pretty young. And so I think those moments are kind of those like wake up aha moments, like, oh my gosh, like, you know, we're not here forever. I need to have that accountability if I want to live the life I want to live. But if you don't have that aha moment, I don't think it's until something or someone comes along, like you said, that makes you realize that you have to take ownership for everything that's going on in your life, whether you cause it or not. It's not to say, and that's one of the things I love to help clients with is helping them take responsibility for every single thing that happens in their life. Now that doesn't mean that you're at fault. It doesn't mean that you did something, but you, for however reason or whatever that shows up and you played a part in a situation, whether you chose to or not, because that's just how life works. And now you're responsible for how you react to that situation, how you choose to use that situation to either make you better or make you worse. Essentially I think that being able to have that kind of aha moment is where a lot of people can then say, okay, wow, um, I don't have accountability to myself and I'm bringing that awareness back in, but I just don't think it's something that's taught. And I don't know if it's something that as a society we've realized is really lacking until now when we're having more of these types of conversations like you and I are having. It stems from parents. It stems from teachers. It's not the teacher's fault. I'm not here to say teachers are bad because I, I was a teacher. One of the reasons, there's many reasons why I love teaching, but was because I saw the whole in what we were creating. The children that were growing up, I knew they would need a coach, mindset coach, fitness coach like yourself, money coach, you, you name it, right? They they needed some type of guidance, some mentor, some some person that's going to be there for them. Sometimes parents are so inundated with providing, especially now in our society, we have two parent households that have, you know, both people have to work just to make ends meet, just to pay the bills, keep the water on, keep the lights on. It's difficult for mom and dad to show up when they're exhausted after work, but they have to. They, it's, it's essential for that child's development because if they don't, that child's not going to learn how to be accountable and that child's going to be rambunctious and they're going to go live their life with no type of guidelines. And when you have an undisciplined child, they become undisciplined adults, typically have negative types of actions and behaviors. Not saying that every child that's undisciplined will come out to be bad. I'm not saying that if your child wasn't disciplined as a young boy or girl, that he or she is going to be bad later on. It's just the probability goes up, right? And we want the probability to be reasonable in the sense of, perception, environment, things like that, right? Things that we don't necessarily have too much control over, perception especially. Environment, we have some type of control over as a pa as parents and adults. So if you're living in a very bad neighborhood, you can do your best to make sure that you get out of that neighborhood or to put your kids into different types of schooling that might protect them from some of those environments that might be harmful, whether it be like gang violence, drugs, things like that, right? When we don't learn accountability, we allow other people to easily tell us what needs to happen in our life. They told me I have to do this versus I'm telling myself I want to do this. And I think it's very important for people to understand, in a sense, their power 
And this is not feminism or anything, but I think like the feministic way of thinking, this is the like 70s way of feminism is that you're stepping into the power. This new modern feminism is not working. But the idea of feminism in, in, in women's rights that were stemming from women want to vote, right? They want equal rights and things like that. That was a proper way to saying, hey, I'm stepping into me being human versus I'm not just some dog that follows you around, right? It's a big difference, right? Today, feminism is more like, I'm owed this. And we can go down that rabbit hole. It is a it is a journey going down that rabbit hole. I went down a three-hour conversation with that two days ago. So it's it's one of those things that that we learn being accountable for our actions. Men are typically held at a higher level of being accountable than women today. If a man does something wrong, he's getting the book thrown at him. Versus if a woman does something wrong today. It, okay, you know, it's a little bit softer, right? And, and we look at the whole aspect of just how society's moving. Women have the ability to be less accountable. I'm not shunning women coaches either, either, because I think learning accountability is the first part. You have to be accountable for your actions. You have to be accountable for the things that you're thinking, because if not, you're just kind of being a, another part of society and you're just showing the future woman this is how we act. This is accepted. There's a big debate on like the Kardashians, right? They have a huge show. This is how women should act. This is how they're acting. Oh, well, it's accepted from their standpoint. Why can't it be accepted in my life? We fail to learn that accountability. And I mean, I've had several coaches on for money, finances, fitness. I mean, you name it. The common trend that I find with coaches especially men coaches, women coaches, it, it doesn't matter, is that they help women become more accountable. They help women find their power. Again, it kind of goes back to what we talked about early on. It's like the stress levels are different. It's like they have so much more to look at now. And it's more difficult, I think, because of our smartphones and of mainstream media and it, 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 all the news is just right there at our fingertips where we can look at something and we can say, oh, I have to worry about this. Oh, I have to be this. Oh, I have to buy that. And before you know it, we have all these materials in our life that don't matter. We have all these feelings and emotions that don't benefit us. And we have all this hardship that we're giving ourselves. We need to learn how to be accountable, to shed all of those stresses that we don't have, and to learn how to prioritize our health and body, mind, and soul. Because if we do that, what comes next? A better life, right? Typically. It's just that so skewed today and that wake up call of saying, hey, you have to be accountable. And it's not the teacher's fault. It's not the parent's fault. Because if you were given a bad hand as a kid, you're now an adult. So you have some choices to make. And at the end of the day, you're in control of your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. And if those three are not controlled by you, who are they controlled by? How can you help men and women? Doesn't necessarily matter. I know I was talking about women. Control their thoughts, their feelings, and their actions, and to be a better human. I think by just bringing, again, like I mentioned before, helping them bring in that level of awareness. Um, one thing I love that you said that I just want to highlight is that accountability actually does equal power. So when you are accountable, when you start practicing that accountability to yourself, to others, to just how you respond in your thoughts, your feelings, your actions in life, that actually is what brings your power back to you. So talking about accountability, especially for women and helping women step into their power, stepping into your power starts with being accountable because at that point, you then have the power to make the choices and the decisions that you need to make in order to get where you want to go, as opposed to viewing life as something that's just happening to you that you have to deal with, whether that's, I was dealt a bad hand as a kid, or, you know, for me, after I lost my mom at a young age, like, that was very much kind of a story that I told myself of something that was kind of holding me back. Well, you know, while my friends and other people my age got to do these things, I was taking care of someone who was terminally ill. And then I had to realize I could actually use that because that locked a whole new viewpoint for me of what, how I viewed life that other people at my age weren't necessarily looking at. And I actually found that to be a beautiful thing. And so I thought, hold on. <laughs> Why am I using this as something that limits me and not using as something that propels me? Because some people don't learn these lessons till they're 40, 50, 60. So it's really about 
life happening for you, not just to you and stepping into that power by first taking that accountability. So for me, when I work with people, it's going back to that self-awareness of where you're at now, where are you being accountable to yourself? Where are you not being accountable to yourself? And again, what are your values? What do you want to create in your life? And how can we start being accountable? And again, removing that emotional component to our decisions. We all make decisions that are very in line with what we want to accomplish. And we all make decisions that aren't so in line. And as long as you can say, okay, that decision either resonates with where I want to go or it doesn't and use that as a learning tool and a step forward, then you're always going to be growing and progressing in the right direction, especially when it comes to health and relationship to body. I, I see a lot of women that get like really down on themselves. Like I, I ate this or you know, I did something that I'm not supposed to do. And it's like, okay, you know, first off, was it a situation where you had fun? Like, did that bring you joy or did you gain something else from that experience? And if the answer is yes, it's like, okay, great. Like you had fun. You, you know, you derived some other value into your life. Let's not dwell on it. You know, again, focusing on making the best decision next time, because what's happened in the past has happened. And there's absolutely nothing we can do to change it by sitting there and dwelling and Again, having that mindset of this happened to me or I have no control over it because you don't have control over what already happened, but you do have control over what happens next. So for me, that is a really big step when working with people on just helping cultivate that awareness and helping them become resilient in their choices because we're all going to get off track. And I tell people all the time, like, have you ever been driving on the highway in your car and all of a sudden you're kind of swerving into the other lane? Like you don't sit there in the other lane, you know, halfway in your lane, halfway in the other lane, like pretending like you're about to hit someone like this is in bumper cars, like you swerve back into your lane. So anytime that we make a decision that maybe pulls us out of our lane, as long as we can swerve back into our lane and keep you know, going down the highway, you're going to be fine. You're going to get there and you're, and you're going to become what you want to be at the end of the day. Perfectly said conversation of body, mind, and soul and fitness and health. It's such a long journey. It's not something as quick as, okay, I listen to a podcast episodes. I'm automatically in shape that that fitness journey can take years sometimes. And you have to be patient with yourself. And you can't give yourself a victim type of mindset of, oh, I had that cake. I had that pizza. You know, I suck. I can't do this, right? Just because you had a moment where you decided to have a simple pleasure doesn't necessarily mean that your whole diet regime is off whack, right? You get to choose how you want to live your life. And if it means a slice of pizza every Friday, you can eat that slice of pizza and there could be no impact to your health and your diet. So you just have to figure out what type of plan you want to be on, what's suitable for your lifestyle and then going forward. But then you do have to be accountable. And you do have to make sure that if you can't be accountable, that you find someone who can hold you accountable. And I always recommend getting yourself a coach like Allie. She is wonderful in the sense of helping people become more accountable, helping people, helping people find a better mind, body, and soul. If you are in that place where you're looking for someone to hold you accountable, if you're looking for a new change in your life, and it doesn't have to be the change that society says, it's the change that you want, the change that you desire. And it begins with you because if you can look at your life and you can figure out what you want, then you can start to make the changes. So Ali, if I can from you, can we have any closing words? And then please tell people how they can find you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for listening. One thing I want to encourage you to do is just, again, take one one thing that you can do that you know is going to make you better. Like Michael said, walk into the mailbox or whatever that is and just start focusing on that. It is a marathon, not a sprint. And as a former sprinter, that was not something I wanted to hear either, but it really is. And just be gentle with yourself in the process. We are all human we're all learning as we go and we're all learning how to be the best versions of ourselves. And there's never an end point. This is a lifelong journey. It's an evolution. And once you get to one place, it's likely that you'll find yourself wanting to go to another and that's perfectly fine. So be gentle with yourself in the process um, and know that the power is within you and you are capable of making those changes. So for anyone who'd like to connect with me, my Instagram is at Ali Cass Health. And then my website is www.allycasshealth.com. I always encourage people follow me, DM me. If there's something you'd like to learn, something you want to know more about, I really try to use my platforms to provide education and to just help people have those resources that they might not otherwise have because we're not taught those things growing up. And I'm always happy to have a conversation with someone so we can talk a little bit further about what it is that you're looking for where you're at now and and what that gap is that's preventing you from getting there. Perfect. And I'll have all those links in the description box below. 
so people can easily follow you and reach out to you so they can begin that process to changing their life around. It doesn't matter where you are in life. It doesn't matter where your circumstances lie in your mind or in reality, to be honest, you can change whatever environment you're in, whatever circumstance you gave yourself, and you can learn to live excuse-free and become accountable. So I want to thank you, Ali Cass, for coming on Coaching a Session. Great conversation. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, I'd like to thank my guest, Ali Cass, again for coming on Coaching in Session. As you can see, she's going to be a wonderful asset in your corner. And my dad, he had a saying, he said, handle your business. And I held that idea throughout my elementary school days, throughout my high school days, throughout my college days, even into my own adult life, where if I stop doing something, I'm very aware that I'm not doing it anymore. Just recently, June, we had our first baby. It came a month early. Now I'm trying to deal with a baby, a business, heavy workload. It was difficult in the beginning. How can I get rid of the things that I don't necessarily need to do anymore to make time? Because he is a huge time sink, but it's a time sink I'm invested in. and It's a time sink I don't mind. But the fact that I had 24 hours before to myself, maybe to my family, but now I have an additional human being that needs some time from me. That needs some attention. And I do my best to make sure that he knows that I'm there. Because it goes back into the episode that we talked about parents have to hold their kids accountable. And if they're out of the picture, how can parents hold their kids accountable? And it's easy to pass on our kids to our teachers, to our coaches, and say, hey, you know, your problem now, not mine. But the problem is, your child should be your priority. And right now, I think in our societies that we make ourselves our priority in the sense of we need to make sure we do the things so then our kids can benefit. But it's backwards because if we do the things for our kids and then intrinsically, it makes us feel better, makes us more inclined to take action. And we have a unique approach of how we should do it. Because if we're just going to simply say, well, I'm busy, because that's the easiest word we can say to tell someone that we don't have time. But what we're actually telling them is when we say I'm busy, it means I don't have time for you. I'm not willing to make time for you. And the fact that I'm not willing to make time for you, or if I don't have time for you, or that I don't want to make time for you, what do you think that does to the mind? What do you think that does to that individual? They learn. And then later down the road, when you want to have a conversation with them, when you need something from them, perhaps they're not available. And the same thing in our life. We all have 24 hours in a day. So there's no one who has more than 24 hours. And it's not the fact that you can just go to a different time zone and you gain an hour. You still have 24 hours in the sense of how long the day is. Because if you think about how the body is going to be functioning, there's a certain amount of sleep you need. Maybe you can be one of those people who can you know, be on three or four hours of sleep. Maybe you need seven or eight hours. Depending on who you are, your age, your maintenance is going to be different. And just because your maintenance is different doesn't necessarily mean that your life can't be any way you want it to be. You can make the right moves, but you do have to know how to move. And the idea of having a coach that's going to hold you accountable is one of the first steps because then you get to say, okay, I have a coach that's going to hold me accountable. I have someone who's going to hold me accountable because my parents didn't hold me accountable because they were too busy for me. And then we start to learn the I'm busy aspect for ourselves. I'm too busy to hold me accountable. But then if you hire a coach, are you still going to be too busy to hold yourself accountable? You have to create that space for yourself. You have to create that flexibility and that time for yourself to change, to evolve, to be better, to grow. Many people struggle with that, that growth aspect. How can I be better? Where do I begin? One of the best places to begin is, again, learning what you need, finding a coach, finding a mentor that's going to help you get to the mindset that you need, get to the body that you need get to the life that you want because we all have these wonderful fantasies in our mind that are not reality yet it's not that our fantasies can't be true it's just that we don't take action to help them come to life so if you're ready be alive again to feel energetic to feel like you can conquer the world you have to begin by looking at yourself looking at your life and seeing what areas in your life do you have to handle your business What areas in your life have you failed to handle your business or where you gave up something in order to make room for something 
because you will find that in your life you're going to have many distractions, many time sinks, many things that are going to take your 24 hours away from you. But just because you have a busy schedule, just because you have a full plate, does not mean that you cannot be a priority. It does not mean that you can just sit there and do nothing. You have to take action today. Because if you don't take action today, your tomorrow will never be what you wanted. So don't live a life full of regret and become accountable so that you can get to the life that you want sooner rather than later. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me coachingaccession at gmail.com. And I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching A Session. Until then, everyone, take care.